Cheers. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone, for inviting me to this. And especially as it's the first one of the academic year for you. So instead of focusing on blood and guts and all that sort of stuff, you're going to get this instead, sex. OK, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, please feel free to chip in as much as you want to. I'll ask you to do some little group work, but it's non-threatening, completely non-threatening. You're not going to be standing on the tables telling us things you don't want to tell us. OK, there's none of that. So please be chilled about it right to the beginning. Is that OK? Yeah, great. OK, so as Sean said, my name is David, and uh, I used to say I'm one of the teachers in sexual health, but I'm the only one now. Uh, so it's a dwindling number here, but it's still really important. And it's fantastic that you've sort of profiled this right at the beginning of your academic year, so thanks. And Sean was asking uh, about Prezi, what Prezi is. Have you seen Prezi's before? Yeah, OK, so like PowerPoint on speed, some people say. And here we go. Right, so <clears throat> what is it we're going to be talking about tonight? And what I thought I'd do to start off with is just to tell you three little stories from when I was so, sort of similar age-ish to some of you. The first one was when I was 17, so obviously younger than all of you, uh, then 20, then 24. And that'll tie in nicely with this whole theme of genders and sexualities. So the first one, uh, I was actually about 20, 21 there, OK, so not 17. But when I was 17, there were only 20 of us on our nursing course. We could start at 17 because we did two years orthopaedics first. So orthopaedics and eyes, you do, did at 17, general nursing was 18. So there were 20 of us in the group. And we all sat in one small classroom and I was the only bloke. And I used to sit right at the back all the time. And the, uh, the, the, the senior tutor we had had been a lieutenant colonel in the army and she was a real bossy thing. And we were all, all totally intimidated by her all the time. And uh, the hospital, orthopaedic hospital, in a field in the middle of nowhere. So to get back into Cardiff, we'd all have to go, be standing on the bus stop outside, waiting for buses into the city. And she used to pass in her little sports car and she'd clock who was standing on the bus stop. To remember now, 17, straight from home, for, for first time away from home for all of us. And she'd come into class the next day, so for 20 of us, and she'd be saying, um, I passed the bus stop last night, and do you know what I saw on the bus stop? And we'd all be sitting there thinking, oh, please, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. And she'd be saying, there were sluts on the bus stop, and harlots, and prostitutes, and everyone's cringing. And she said, because they were standing there with short skirts, lots of makeup on. And it was half of us in the classroom. So then all of a sudden, her voice would get louder, and she'd be walking up and down the aisles, intimidating us, me sitting in the back, remember. And she'd be coming up and down the aisles, and she'd say, There's no place in this hospital for sluts or harlots. And she'd come near me, she'd say, Or puffers. So if there are any, go now. Now, that's all I did on sexualities and genders at the age of 17. And you can imagine the impression that that left. Which is great, because look at the way it's all completely turned around now. All right, I talk about sex all the time. So, that was it at 17. Then the next one, to do with genders, um, Thanks to the European Union, the law changed and brought in gender equality. So for the first time, male students were allowed to go and work on female wards. And it meant I could choose to do a two-month obstetrics secondment. So up until then, male students couldn't do obstetrics at all. Which is going to be important for you, because some of you will be doing stuff around childbirth. I wasn't allowed to uh, until about the age of 20. And when I first applied to do it, the senior midwife in the, in the hospital I was in, she hated men and didn't want any man doing midwifery. So I had to go over to Swansea and do it there because they'd already had a few men working at that hospital. But when I got there, again, this severe looking lecturer came up to me and she gave me a list like the Ten Commandments. And she said, these are the things you can't do. And when I looked at them, it was things like, if a woman had had an episiotomy, I wasn't allowed to remove the sutures. If she was breastfeeding, if she wanted the curtains closed around her bed, that was a sign that I mustn't be there. If the curtains were open, that was okay for me to look. But on the list it said, but you mustn't express a woman. Okay, so I couldn't do that. And then I had to work a couple of weeks on nights when there was only one midwife and one student. And we had two postnatal wards. 
So the next day, to wake all the patients up, the midwife would go on one ward and the student would go on the other. And we were carrying baskets of sanitary towels and breast pads. So six o'clock in the morning, wake all the women up and give them their sanitary towels and breast pads for the day. And there was this one woman sitting there with a screaming baby. She was all flushed and really stressed, didn't know how to breastfeed. And the baby was getting more and more anxious and the more the baby was crying, she was. Now remember, I wasn't allowed to touch her. Okay, so I'm just saying to her, look, just go like that with your nipple. You know, hold the baby's face and stick the baby on, trying to explain it. And all the other women, were my, they, they were my chaperones. Okay, and they were shouting, go out and do it for her. So in the end, the woman said, please, look, I'm struggling. So I did. So I expressed her, put the baby on, and that was it. A few weeks later, I was back on days, and this senior tutor came up to me, really severe looking face. And she said to me, I hear you expressed a woman the other week. And I said, yes, I did. And all of a sudden, she cracked a smile. And she said, well, congratulations, it worked really well. So from now on, men can do it as long as the woman doesn't object. OK, so breaking through barriers, and that's really important as well. And the third one I want to tell you about, I promise I'll stop telling stories then. The third one, when I was about the age of 24, I think I was 30 there, but yeah, around about the age of 24, um, that's when the world first heard about this new illness, whatever it was called, and it was called AIDS. OK, so the first time the world ever heard anything about it, I was 24 at the time. And I was uh, studying to be a Roman Catholic priest. So I did nursing for five years, then seven years studying to be a priest. So for me, it was really great because at the time I was under a vow of celibacy, so no sex at all. So whatever this new illness was in the world, and it seemed to be tagged at that time to sexualities. The worrying thing for me was that before I'd gone off to become a priest, I, in my teenage years, I had had sex. And I'd even had sex with an American. So when they were talking about, um, oh, this is all starting in America, it didn't, but that's what people thought at the time. It's starting in America and it's something to do with gay sex and everyone was panicking. So at the time, being under a vow of celibacy, it seemed like a great relief thinking, well, I don't have to do anything about sex, but I just wonder. But these three stories, the reason I wanted to tell you those is because look at the way in which sexualities and genders just tap into so much of our lives, OK? Whether it's your professional life, whether it's your personal life, sexualities and genders are going to be important um, at, at all stages. And it might even be on occasions where you're called out on a shout and maybe the person you're going out to doesn't want you there for some reason or other. Or the person you're called out to has gone through certain uh, um, uh, experiences that are going to really challenge the way you feel about things. So I just wanted to give you those brief stories uh, by way of saying this will impact on you throughout your lives. OK, topics of sexuality and genders. And that's why it's wonderful that you've asked me to do this right at the start. OK, so for some of you, um, have any of you done the session with me on HIV? Some of you have, and recently, for some of you, yeah, okay, right. So that's the starting point. Um, your lecturers asked me to do this session, and I do it each year, but this is the only session on anything at all related to sex. So I do that session on HIV, and it's very much focused on your clients. So if you're caring for somebody with HIV, what are the things you need to know about it? Okay, so that's very much the focus of that session. But obviously, it's going to touch some of you as well. Because sometimes, for example, I can do that session and someone will come up to me afterwards and say, actually, somebody passed a comment that I found really homophobic. Or somebody passed a comment that was discriminatory. So it's how to deal with that sort of stuff as well. Right? So it could be that although you're getting this clinical stuff, this is HIV, this is how you care for people living with HIV, but it may touch you as well, um, even around your attitudes and your beliefs. And we can explore some of that later. Does that seem okay? Is there anything anybody wants to say instead of me talking at you all the time? No? Are you all okay for a minute? Yeah? Okay.